this idea, the idea of image-guided metastasis-directed therapy, it's not a new one, but it's, it's very much new to be in the mainstream. So I'm going to go back a little bit. Um, Dr. Carroll alluded to uh, one of my best friends, Felix Fang. And Felix Fang and I were residents, and we were sitting and we were talking about how we do radiation therapy for prostate cancer in the post-prostatectomy setting. And you'd think it was like really defined, right? We, we're going to aim at, at something that everybody does, everybody does the same way. And in truth, we really didn't. So um, later, uh, I had the pleasure of, of sitting in ASCO um, with Jeff Mahalski who's professor at, at WashU, and at that point we had had fancy imaging, but it wasn't that fancy. It was, it was uh, C11 imaging, and it was just starting to take off. And we talked about, hey, would we ever consider doing image-guided metastasis-directed therapy? And the two of us looked at each other and says, is radiation oncologist? We get laughed out of the room. We get laughed out of a tumor board in front of urologists or medical oncologists. And I think the pendulum is definitely swung. It's an incredibly exciting time to be a radiation oncologist. So the, the idea of metastasis-directed therapy in prostate cancer. The management of metastatic disease has classically been thought of as systemically, with systemic agents. But local therapies, whether they be surgery or radiation therapy, have been used, and they've been used primarily for palliation of symptomatic lesions. Indeed, radiation oncology can be indicated for reducing pain caused by osseous metastasis. It can be delivered in either a single or a fractionated approach, or it could be used uh, with systemic radiopharmaceuticals. Beyond palliation, radiation may also impact the course of metastatic disease. And the aggressive treatment of metastatic disease using a metastasis-directed approach could alter the natural history of metastatic disease and or be curative by limiting disease burden and preventing further spread. This dates back to a concept by Hellman and Wechselbaum, and when they talked about a clinical state of oligometastasis on a continuum where metastatic disease is present but potentially curable through consolidation of both the primary tumor and metastasis with, system, with, with local therapies. The oligometastatic state includes a variety of things. It can be the de novo hormone-naive metastatic patient who's presenting at initial diagnosis. It could be the oligorecurrent disease following definitive primary treatment with surgery and radiation. And it can be an isolated area of treatment-resistant or oligoprogressive disease, which persists after an otherwise su su successful systemic treatment in the case of castro-resistant prostate cancer. So I was fortunate to write this paper a few years ago uh, with some of the luminaries of, of stereotactic radiation. And at this point, it wasn't really mainstream, but we said that stereotactic radiation for prostate cancer was both rational and reasonable. The radiobiology of prostate cancer led itself to want to give radiation with bigger doses in a shorter period of time. And indeed, there may be some unique aspects of being able to deliver big doses of energy through stereotactic approaches. There may be unique biological effects, and the use of large doses per fraction provides a unique potential for biological effects on both the tumor and normal tissues. High doses of radiation could induce tumor changes, stromal changes, through the in vivo activation of vascular endothelia apoptotic pathways. And indeed, I've been always very interested in the immunologic responses, and those responses in normal tissues, local stromal environments, and antigen-presenting cells, when, when delivered in high dose rates, can be very, very effective. In this paper, which I had the, the, the fortune of publishing with Bob Timmerman, who's one of the godfathers of stereotactic approach, we talk about how SABR, or SBRT, can induce cellular expression of MHC1 class molecules, adhesion molecules, co-stimulatory molecules, heat shock proteins, inflammatory mediators and cytokines, and death receptors. Indeed, using SBRT can be very interesting and different than doing what people would call 
radiation through external beam conventional fractionation. Now, how does SABRE work as metastasis-directed therapy? Well, it's well-tolerated and is clinically effective. There have been prospective and retrospective trials showing safety and efficacy, and SABRE is well-tolerated with grade 3 toxicity occurring in only a few patients with no grade 4 or 5s in some of the largest studies. SABRE appears effective with a lesion control uh, at one year in the very, very high rates of 97 to 100% and a little bit lower at two years. Indeed, some of this data comes from, uh, from ORIOL. Uh, in ORIOL, which was a large trial, SABRE improved the median progression-free survival with total consolidation of PSMA radio tracer avid disease, decreasing the risk of new lesions at six months. Indeed, SABRE may facilitate the delay of ADT initiation with a favorable safety profile and durable lesion control. This led to a lot of interest in using this approach to forestall the initiation of stuff like androgen deprivation because it does have unpleasant side effects such as hot flashes, fatigue, and sexual dysfunction. In a trial, STOMP, to my ot et al, randomized men with three or fewer extracranial prostate cancer metastasis to either surveillance or SABRE to all sites, all sites, all sites of detectable disease with a median, a median follow-up of 36 months. And the median ADT-free survival was 21 months versus 13 would not do an SBRT. So how do you select patients for metastasis-directed therapy? Well, you got to define what oligometastatic prostate cancer is. So the number of metastatic foci are often used to define the state. Nine prospective clinical studies have numerically defined what that is. Three trials allowed up to three sites, two up to four, three studies up to five metastases, and one study went as high as calling the oligometastatic state up to 10 metastases. For this audience, the literature reviews generally include five or fewer lesions as, metas uh, as oligometastatic prostate cancer. Now, when we consider definitions, the difference in imaging modalities is a key, uh, a key finding. As Dr. Crawford alluded to, what you see on conventional imaging, technetium-99 bone scans, and fancy next-generation imagings is, is going to be very different about how many lesions are going to actually show up. So a critical limitation of any numerical definition of a ligometastatic state is its reliance on detection mechanisms. As I talked about, there's a variety of cool imaging of which we're talking about here today, and all of these things functionally changes the definition of oligometastatic disease. Patients with five or fewer lesions detectable with next-generation imaging may represent a patient population with a lower disease burden than what those we've classically talked about with conventional imaging. Here you see a, uh, a breakdown of some of the radiologic techniques. We've been doing this as part of, of, of the other lectures, so I'm going to sort of jump ahead a little bit. I think we need to talk more, again, about the location of metastasis. The nodal or skeletal metastasis are the most commonly studied, with visceral disease being most rare and affording a worse prognosis and rel relatively poor systemic responses. Inclu that includes liver and lung, which are the centerpieces for stereotactic approaches. Do these lesions represent individual deposits that may benefit from metastasis-directed therapy uh, or versus an unfavorable biology that should be best approached systemically? And let's talk, you know, for those who know me, you know that I did surgery and I'm surg a fellowship trained surgical oncologist. So surgical resection is an alternative approach to radiation. And surgical resection may be the preferred local intervention based on the tumor's location, such as you got a spinal metastasis threatening with cord compression, or you have brain metastasis favoring rapid surgical intervention, or you have a central lung lesion where SABRE could cause higher toxicity, the Timmerman no-fly zone. How about dose and fractionation? Well, SABRE for the definitive treatment of prostate cancer has used regimens with biological effective disease uh, doses, which are quite high. 168 to 407 is evidenced by a BED of over 200, is associated potentially with better disease control. And STOMP, the trial I alluded to by Ott earlier, published a 
in that uh, randomized trial using 30 gray and three fractions. Other trials and ob observational studies have used doses from 16 to 50 and one to five fractions. And again, we, we may feel that a BED that's higher is probably associated with superior local control. We always got to function in the toxicity, the side effects, and the toxicity for Sabre is generally mild. When we do radiation, we can give it boom, 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 boom every day, or we could give it every other day. And every other day scheduling is often used. It's been shown to reduce the side effects compared to daily treatments when giving big doses. How do we do this? This gets a little bit more uh, technically nuanced for the radiation oncologist, but we got to figure out where it is, what the gross tumor volume is, which is all that's seen on imaging. Then we figure out what we think that we, we might be missing, and we call that the clinical target volume. And we base on such a such spinal vertebral metastasis spread, typically on consensus guidelines. And then for as radiation oncologists, we put in a little fudge factor in because people can move, and we put in based on their setup and motion and uncertainties. We call that the PTV. Now, again, these we build dose constraints based on organs at risk, and there have been exciting companies which have brought to market devices and the techniques to move targets away so we can limit targets to structures at risk. Now it brings in the interesting uh, part that how do we do SABRE, how do we do fancy radiation with other therapies, concurrent ADT and other systemic therapies such as radiopharmaceuticals. The goal of metastasis directed therapy is to avoid the toxicity of systemic therapy. However, treatment intensification should and could be employed in appropriate cases. The simultaneous eradication of sites of mi micrometastatic disease by systemic therapy is very appealing. You could give concurrent ADT, second generation antiandrogens, chemotherapies, or systemic radiopharmaceuticals. And there's a lot of new, exciting radiopharmaceuticals coming down the pike. Again, we don't have level one evidence for these pathways, but these are the kind of studies that will be done in the next years, and we'll, be, we'll know much more of the answers. In summary, metastasis-directed therapy via SABRE is a well-tolerated approach in prostate cancer with proven palliative ability. Its strongest indication currently would be for pain relief for symptomatic lesions. It can provide durable disease control either alone or in combination with other therapies. There's now randomized data, randomized phase two stomp trial, and an increasing body of retrospective series in phase one, two trials, uh, suggesting that SABRE may also be a valuable tool in the definitive management of oligometastatic prostate cancer. And as one who be, as was a surgeon who became a radiation oncologist, it's an incredibly exciting time as future work needs to, be, to continue to explore and advance clinical opportunities.